Welcome to this, the 40th installment of View the Right Thing. On this episode of the podcast, we pair up a documentary and a Steven Spielberg film based on a true story, both about parental custody. First, Wes and Steve delve into the tragic tale of a documentary filmmaker making a tribute to his childhood best friend who was allegedly murdered by his ex-girlfriend. Things take an unexpected twist when the accused ex-girlfriend announces that she is pregnant with her deceased boyfriend's child in Dear Zachary. Our second film stars Goldie Hawn as a mother desperate to reunite her family by breaking her husband out of prison, kidnapping their own son from foster care, and taking a policeman hostage as they attempt to outrun local and state Texas police in Steven Spielberg's first widely distributed film, The Sugarland Express. And now it's time for View the Right Thing. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Ring Jing 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 Ring Jing 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 Jing. You know this is going to air in January. I guess that's true. But hey, Sometimes we record a little ahead. <laughs> There's still plenty of snow on the ground. <laughs> sure. You still need to take a horse-drawn sleigh sure. wherever you're going. It's the fastest way to travel in the snow. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is the movie podcast where uh, you get to watch the movie ahead of time and then tune in and listen to it. That's right. Let's talk about it. Today we watched two movies about child custody problems. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're both about a whole lot more than that. Of course. Frankly, Crime. I'll say... These are the two movies about child custody problems that don't get discussed often enough. Everybody sure. talks about Kramer versus Kramer. Sure. And Over the Top. Sure. Over the Top, okay. When's the last time you heard two people do a deep dive on Dear Zachary and... Sugarland Express. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you when the last time was. Tonight, baby. So we have to hear it. We've had uh, Christmas. We've had uh, Boxing Day. Our, we already had our our uh, Steven, our first Steven Spielberg episode. Yeah, already, it was already released. And uh, since then, we've had our first episode with Joey Hanza. Oh, cool! Um, who's not here, obviously? Talking about Black Dynamite. Talking about Black Dynamite. That was fun. has that come out yet? I'm pretty I mean, sure it has. You know, it's out. I guess now. by the time these guys are hearing us, yeah. it'll be out. Yeah. It, so listen to the Black Dynamite video, then come back to this one. It came video out. It episode. came out January first. There you go. Um, I like that. <clears throat> Live in the now, in man. Yeah, then we got church bells ringing. Jing, you want to you talk? Uh, you want to talk trailers? <clears throat> want to talk trailers first? Whoa! I have seen a lot of trailers lately. I'm trying to think what I've seen. I've seen A Wrinkle in Time. I have not seen that trailer yet. I've seen the new trailer for Ready Player One. I saw that one. Featuring Jump by Van Halen. And uh, Tracer from Tracer. Overwatch was in it. Oh, yeah. They're slowly like revealing other properties that they've yeah. licensed. I'm pretty sure I saw Chucky in it. Yeah. Very and briefly. And I'm not surprised by that one because... Good old Chucky. Spielberg and Universal have a... Yeah. Chucky will do anything. I saw the trailer for A Wrinkle in Time. I think I already said that. Uh-huh. I saw the trailer for that Natalie Portman... The alien one. Annihilation? Is that what it's called? Annihilation? Something like that. Oh, my God. Yeah, that one looks cool. I we- hope it's weird. cool. Yeah, man. It's just uh, it's just an all-ladies remake of uh, Evolution, man. If you remember Evolution with Duchovny I don't, uh, I don't think, and Julianne I don't Moore. Think so. This is know. just... Like, oh, why do ladies need a remake of Evolution, oh man? You know I'm just joking around. Here he goes again. Old was, misogynist uh, Steve. I was possessed by a Trump supporter for a minute there. Yeah. Um, no, I do think Annihilation does look cool. I don't think it really looks like an all-ladies remake of it doesn't, Evolution. but it, it doesn't strike me as a movie that I like terribly want to see, but it doesn't have moments in the trailer that I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be worth seeing. Yeah. I saw... Uh, so, uh, kind of a remake, I guess more of a reboot. Ocean's 8. Ocean's 8. See, I would say it's just a flat out sequel. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a reboot in the sense that they're restarting the whole yeah. thing up again. But this time it's you can Danny's have a sequel. sister. Yeah. Which can, means Danny still exists in... Well, they explain where Danny is in, in the, the trailer. In the universe, oh, I haven't seen it yet. Uh. But the bottom line is, you know, this is... 
just a shifting of oceans now. We've yeah. gone from Danny Ocean to his sister, Billy Ocean? It looked, yeah. What's her name? I don't know. I can't remember. Danielle Ocean? Ocean? The only thing that matters is that she's an ocean. Yeah. Uh, it looks really fun. Good. I hope so. Looks like it's got a good cast. I like the sound of that. Um, I wish that the <clears throat> the MacGuffin of the film Uh-oh. wasn't a woman thing. It's definitely centered around, like, you know... Women are doing this heist because it's a, kind of a woman's thing. Oh. I wish... I mean, I guess it's like, okay, women can have a full whatever movie, but I kind of like liked the idea of women just doing a thing. Not, yeah. Not because it's a woman thing. Now I'm very intrigued. Yeah, when you see what it is that they're going after, you'll kind of be like, huh? Huh. Well, I guess that's stereotypical. Oh, really? Yeah. Weird. Very weird indeed. What other trailers have I seen? Or have you seen the trailer? Um, Poor. Of course, Infinity War is out I there. I, could say, I, I closed my eyes and plugged my ears. I wish I, I had. To myself. It looks so awesome, but... And then I had somebody spoil one little thing for me, but it wasn't a big Are deal. Are you serious? It, it, was, it was not a big deal. The very final moment? Nope. I don't know. I don't okay. know. If, no, it's, it's an inconsequential, probably, uh, a cosmetic thing. Oh, so, um, oh, Midnight Sun is yeah, navy Midnight blue Sun. instead of purple. Yeah, I knew it. Um, Desi laughed. Yeah, upstairs, she heard you upstairs. Um, <clears throat> no, uh, so I didn't. I didn't watch that. I didn't watch that trailer. I think All we, right. What else played in front of Star Wizzle? Scream Five. No, still screaming. I got up. I got up. Uh, I realized like right before the movie was going to start that I need to I probably should use the restroom. Oh, good. And thing. so I got up hoping that they would play Avengers while I was in the restroom, but they didn't. They oh were playing no! Annihilation. But I had already seen the Annihilation trailer, so it wasn't a big deal. There you go. Um, yeah, I can't really remember what else I saw during that. Um, Did you watch any good Christmas movies that you hadn't revisited in a long time? I didn't watch. <sighs> I don't think I watched a single Christmas movie this year. I finally got around to watching The Santa Claus 3, The oh, Escape Clause. Super important. It wasn't. Um, and it never will be. I watched uh, Moana for the first time. Oh, yeah. Moana's a pretty movie. And uh, The Zookeeper's Wife. You had warned me not to watch The Zookeeper's Wife. Not that Wife. I warned you not to watch it. I warned you that there's a lot of hard stuff to see as an oh. animal lover in the first, like, 40 minutes of the movie. Oh, gosh. Is it better or worse than The Astronaut's Wife? Better than The Astronaut's Wife. Better or worse than The Preacher's Wife? I mean, I don't like The Preacher's Wife, but there's lots of people who do. Better or worse than The Butcher's Wife? I mean... I'm not sure if that's actually a movie. Yeah, I, I feel don't... like that was a movie with Demi Moore. I guess I should ask with The Preacher's Wife, the original or the remake. Actually, it's the same. Six one Take hand, your pick. Half a dozen in the other. All right. All right. It's all right. It's it's worth probably worth seeing. It's a good story, especially if you don't know the story. It's um, Who's the uh, lead in that again? Jessica Chastain. Jessica Chastain. Oscar winner. Yep. And uh, the guy who played Roos Bolton. The in guy the who played Roos Bolton. Bolton. I can't think of that guy's name. I guess spoiler alert, since I said played. <laughs> uh, I never would have picked up on that. Well, I made a point of pointing it out. So. In a way. Oh, well. You know what? Delete this entire intro. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm pretty certain our fans are caught up on Game of Thrones. They've had plenty of time. A lot of people who are like, I think I'm going to finally start Game of Thrones. Really? Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of people say stuff like that. I think there's a lot of people that are kind of waiting. So they can just binge the whole thing? Yeah, or get it close to... I don't even know if I'm going to bother watching the final season. Shut up. Yes, you are. (laughs) Ah, Of course. Are there any... uh... something in my eye. Well, that was was pretty quick. Talking about movies in the theater. I guess we didn't really talk about movies in the theater. What did you see in the theater? You saw Star Wars? I've seen Star Wars twice. I've seen Lady Bird. I've not seen Lady Bird. Did you watch Lady Bird in the theater? Yes. Oh. My buddy Skylar was there, and he is convinced that actor Lucas Hedges, who is in Lady Bird and who also plays uh, the nephew in... Paddington. No. Um, Manchester by the Sea. 
Okay. Uh, the redhead main nephew kid. Yeah. Skyler is convinced that kid was sitting right in front of us as we watched the movie. Now, a young, tall man with light hair, but I really couldn't tell if it was red, uh-huh. stood up at the end of the movie. And Skyler was like, that's him. That's totally the kid. Yeah. And he sort of turned and looked around over the audience, and then he got out of there real fast. But getting only an, a so-so glance at his face, I could not tell that, that it was That is him. suspicious, though. It's a su- suspicious way to leave a movie. Very suspicious. But that kid has a very distinct nose, and the person who stood up in front of me didn't seem to have that nose. But then again, it's a dark room. Light, shadow. And when you see people in person, it's very different than how you see them on film a lot of the time. That's also true. They they often look skinnier. Wow. Now that I think about it, his nose was skinnier. I knew it. That I don't know for sure. But yeah, Skylar was like, I'm telling you, man, that's him. I'm like, why would he come to see his own movie alone when I'm sure he's already seen it at the premiere (coughs) and whatnot? Sorry, listeners. It's all right, man. Tis the season got, for colds and flus. I got a little little uh, allergy thing going on, actually. Everybody out there, you wash your hands before you touch your face. And um, don't get allergies. Are you getting movies for Christmas? No. I got uh, I got a nice 4K copy of Dunkirk. Oh, yeah? Still haven't seen the movie, so I'm excited to watch it for the first time. Dunkirk is a bit of a doozy. I'm going uh, crank the sound up really loud. and Comedian Jimmy Pardo saw that three times in the theater. Wow. Loves it. I appreciate it. I don't know if I need to watch it again. Uh-huh. But it's definitely worth watching. For sure. Um, and I got a, a 3D copy of uh, Spider-Man Homecoming. So I'm very excited about that. I've heard of Spider-Man Homecoming. I didn't see it in 3D. So to be Whoa. able to watch it in 3D, I'm very excited. Now is that the one? Maybe I shouldn't spoil it. Yeah, probably not. Isn't there, you know, Aunt May? Well, I mean, Aunt May's in Civil War, which came out like two years ago. Oh. So you can talk about Aunt May. Yeah. Marissa Tomei playing Aunt May. Uh Uh-huh. Pretty cool. Yeah. Star of My Cousin Vinny. Well, she was in a movie with Robert Downey Jr., who was also in the movie. What was that? The Pickup Artist? Pickup Artist, yeah. That's true. Oh, man. I like where this is going. Should we dive in to... Dear Zachary, yet are we ready to cry? I mean, I'm I'm ready to talk about it. I mean, I think we're going to probably go like broad strokes, right? We should really broad strokes that, especially movie, if it's so. I know thing sad. <laughs> I know some people um, listen to the podcast without watching the movies. Yeah, please watch this movie. Please watch Dear Zachary. Do you, you think it's worth watching? Absolutely. Yeah, but boy, oh boy. Just know it's kind of a bummer of a time. But what I love about the movie is that it actually has like a really beautiful message. And like it's like at the end you're just like, that's really, really sweet. I agree with you there. <clears throat> I also I like... I definitely agree with you there. I also like that as the filmmaker, Kurt, is taking his journey, we're on the exact same identical journey. Yeah. We don't, unless you know about the, the story ahead of time... We don't know anything that Kurt doesn't know. Right. Um, that part's pretty cool. Yeah, it's definitely told in a very, very kind of new way. I mean, he essentially addresses us, the audience, as Zachary, which is a pretty, it, pretty interesting way to, to watch a movie. And, and while, it, while it takes place over the course of sort of, sort of 30 years, 35 years or so, yeah. um, the, the crux of it is over, I don't know, Maybe um, like two-ish years? No, uh, a little more than that, because, let's see, maybe maybe closer to like four to six years, somewhere in that area. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's uh, but it but he tells it at a, like kind of a breakneck speed, like the yeah. way how fast he talks and how fast he edits lines together. Yeah. Um, there he doesn't really let up off the gas much in the movie. Like it's usually like a lot of fast cuts. Yeah, um, people talking very quickly, especially all of his stuff is very fast, very succinct. Yeah, and when he repeats himself, he does it very intentionally and with effect. I fully agree with that. I also thought it was pretty interesting that during some of the narration, when he's reading like official documents and stuff, yeah, uh, you can hear the poor guy on the verge of tears as he tries to get through what he has to read. Yeah, and that is extremely effective. Yep. Maybe even a little unfair. 
So the, but certainly the, effective. A real broad stroke, like how would we describe it? If we were ta- trying to tell somebody what this movie was about without spoiling things. Well, I feel like we have to at least spoil the first thing. The very first thing, which is, so the documentary is this documentary filmmaker who's making a sort of a love letter yeah. to a, a child, Zachary. Right. About who his father was because his father has died. Right. Um... Andrew. Yes, yeah, so we can leave it kind of at that. Like he's making his father has died, and so he's making this this letter to this child, Zachary, to explain who his father was and to show like how many people loved this guy. Yeah, and why and why they loved him. Um, <clears throat> Pretty and wild. It's, and it's it's not simple. No. Um, and it's a bit of a harrowing journey, and. Uh, it was definitely a harrowing journey. Uh, I had something in my eye a few times during oh, the yeah. movie. As I had mentioned, it is a nonstop kick in the dick. <laughs> yeah. For, <laughs> for, as soon as, as, soon for, as it was over. For quite a bit of it. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a must-see. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, maybe do something really, really, really happy before you sit down to watch this movie. And then maybe have something really happy lined up to do right after you watch this movie. Yeah, the full title. it's going to get you. The full title is Dear Zachary, A Letter to a Son About His Father. There you go. There you have it, folks. Dear Zachary by filmmaker Kurt Kuene? 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 Well, it's spelled... I, I, I thought it was maybe Kuhn. Kuhn. It could be Kuhn. It's K-U-E-N-N-E. Kuhn. That could be pronounced a number of ways. Um... Kurt Kuhn. I like Kuhn. Yeah. It's a, it's a really fantastic... Why? <laughs> why? Rhymes. Yeah. Um, fantastic movie. Yeah. Totally worth seeing. I'm sorry we're not going into you know, extreme detail on it. Because yeah. this, is, this is one of those few times where we watch a movie and it's... To talk about it is to spoil it. And right. It's one of those times where I feel so strongly that people should watch it, that they should... I mean, feel free to shoot us messages and give us your take on it. But Yeah, tweet um, at VTRT hmm. Movies and be like, hey, I watched Dear Zachary. Why didn't you guys tell me about blah, blah, blah? And the answer is, we didn't tell you because you got to see it for yourself. Yeah. Well, and, and there's also like, you know, a lot of these movies we can look up and do some research on and find out interesting facts about the sure. film. But... All of the facts are in this film, so yeah. there there isn't really like if you go to the IMDb page or whatever, there there isn't anything there under trivia because they just kind of bear it all on film. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's not a whole lot we can we can do about that's, going too in depth. That's very true. Well, shout out to Kurt and the whole family. Yep. For 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 getting that thing done, man. I mean, you see a lot of broken hearts on your screen when you watch this movie. Absolutely. A lot of broken hearts. A lot of total eclipses of the heart. I might... Uh, I might never fall in love with anybody from New Finland ever again. Yeah. Ever again in my life. I can't blame it all on New Finland. That's not right. There's a bunch of stuff that takes place in Pennsylvania. A bunch of it does. You're but from Pennsylvania. I am. They're talking about good old Latrobe, home of uh, Rolling Rock yeah. Beer. Rolling Rock, it used to be my beer of choice, but then... Didn't the guy say uh, home of the uh, banana split? Possibly home of the banana split, he said. I'd be pretty interested to find out if that's true. And I'm going to find out by eating a banana split eventually. Maybe not now, you know, it's winter, it's cold. I don't need a banana split right now. Should we jump into Steven Spielberg's... First... First... Real theatrical film. 1974. Outside of Firelight. Don't send me angry things about Firelight. Okay. I um, won't. No, not you. I mean the listeners. <laughs> uh, um, 1974. Steven Spielberg. Mm-hmm. Goldie Hawn. William Atherton. In. The Sugarland Express. That's the one. So you had never seen this, right? I'd never ever seen it. Did you know about the Sugarland? The story? Story before. No, I'd the, never had. The kidnapping? I never had. Um, I guess I guess it's more of like a hostage. It's yeah, kidnapping too. I mean, it's a whole bunch of things, but um, I feel like I think when you say kidnapping, you think children, right? Oftentimes, 
It's a it's cop napping. Cop napping. Um, so in the late sixties, um, these people kid kidnapped a state trooper to get to their child who was in foster care because they bo- had both been in prison. Yeah. Um, Poor little baby. Their real names. Yeah. Were uh, Robert and Isla Fay. Robert Dent. and Isla Fay Dent. Dent. Dent, okay. Maybe it was Ila Fay. I don't know. I think it's was Isla Fay. Oh, all right. In the, in the movie, her name is Lou Jean, which is like sort of still that kind of southern two name thing. Yeah. Um, Lou Jean. Are you shouting outside? They're shouting outside. Uh, so, besides being the first film directed by Steven Spielberg, um, it's the first use of some camera equipment and techniques, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I had one of the most dangerous stunts I've ever seen in my life. Uh, <laughs> maybe not most, but probably wasn't as dangerous. Definitely as... one of the dumbest. <laughs> yeah, we don't know what was in the water. I mean, I don't know. It could have been like there could have been safety pads and stuff in there. Could have gone wrong a lot of ways. Though. Sure. No, well, yeah, you worry, you worry, we'll talk about it, I guess, in a little bit, but... Yeah. Um, oh, my gosh. So, the Goldie Hawn's character, Lou Jean, shows up at the uh, pre-release detention center. Yeah. Her, her boyfriend, played by William Atherton. William Atherton of Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters, yeah. And Real Genius, and a whole lot more. Sure. Um, so, Lou Jean shows up to um, basically break Clovis, her boyfriend, out. But he's only got four months. Yeah, he's only got four months left. And but she's like, no, we got to do this now. Um, they never really explain why. I think maybe just the idea that the kid's going to get to know these other people really well and could be come part of to it. know them as uh, as parents. Yeah, is probably the deal. But they never really explain why. Like now, it has to happen now. We can't wait four months. Yeah, um, Lujin hmm. is definitely a lady who. Uh... You know, she wants things done her way or the highway. Right. Hi, so hi, they highway. take it to the highway. Yeah. So uh, she breaks him out. Yeah. yeah. Pretty pretty ingenious. I would say she almost just walks him out. She does walk him out. Uh, so they walk out. They hitch a ride with an elderly couple. Yeah. Steal their car. They leave them cute. stranded. Yeah, they were pretty cute. Buick Roadmaster. Looks good. And uh, Doesn't run very good. Through uh, some circumstances of getting pulled over and a little bit of a car chase, they end up taking a uh, state patrol officer, Slide, Officer Slide. Yeah. Um, take him hostage in, in his car and uh, force him to drive to uh, Sugarland. Sugarland, so Texas. Their, get their child. And, of course, the police get alerted and there's uh, basically... Uh, one of the longest uh, police chases. <laughs> I would say so. Longest, uh, not not necessarily t- just time wise or distance wise, but also uh, um, actual, actual cars yeah. in a caravan following them. I hope that was the longest ever. If there's a longer police chase in history, yeah. I'm afraid to know about it. And Spielberg had to uh, shoot on a longer lens and uh, a little higher to the ground. Remember uh, in Duel, remember he shot real low to the cars. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but because Texas is so flat, they uh, they they couldn't show all the cars. Oh wow! So he had to sort of change his approach to how he would shoot something like that. I'll say it. Yeah, there might be more cars in Sugarland Express than in Duel. Okay, just pointing that out. I uh, I noticed that the um, so there's a a news crew that. Um, Follows them yeah. around, and there's a scene when there's a roadblock pretty early in the film, and the uh, cameraman gets this r- kind of cool harness. Yeah, it's like a precursor to the steady cam. If people don't know what, oh. what the steady cam is, it's a big harness you wear that you attach a camera to, and it's um, heavy count- as hell. It's really it's a, about an extra like I don't know eighty pounds. That's what I've heard. Yeah, um, and uh, I mean there's different kinds, and there's some that aren't true steady cam. They're like glide cams and stuff. But like a true steady cam, it's about an extra eighty pounds Yo, on top of so. the camera equipment weight. Um, but it uses um, uh, like a counterweight system, yeah, um, to be able to smoothly move around. And so when you see, you know, what are considered to be handheld shots in film and television, it's usually on a steady cam. You know, if you've ever watched the show ER or West Wing, yeah, and people are moving in and out of rooms and the camera's following, and it's. It's usually they're on a steady cam. A man wearing his camera. Yeah. And 
an 80 pound rig to keep that camera steady while he walks. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. To, you know, seeing a steady cam rig on and you're just like, well, why couldn't you just hold it more still when you, but it's like, no, it makes a huge oh, yeah, difference. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Huge difference. Uh, so anyways, uh, this, this guy wears the precursor to sort of the steady cam. He, he, yeah. he snaps his thing in. Which is interesting because about two years after this movie comes out, the first film to ever feature a steady cam shot, Rocky, really uh, is released. So it, it was kind of neat to see this two years prior. That's extremely neat. Rocky was 76. I always have 77 in mind for Rocky, but that can't yep. be right. 76. Did you ever hear the the Rocky story that I uh, heard from uh, Carl Weathers one time? No, I mean I've not heard it. I want to hear it. It's a little it's a little appropriate right now. Real short story. So Carl Weathers tells this story where he was going into an audition for Apollo Creed in the movie Rocky. On he went in, did his audition, felt really really good about it. Yeah. Came out of the audition, and this younger whiter dude gets into the elevator with him and you know just notices that like weathers just has this big smile on his face and the guy's just like hey man how's it going you auditioning and he's like yeah and he's like i feel pretty good about this thing man this thing might be kind of big and the other dude goes wow man that's cool that you say that because i was in for this this movie and i got a feeling it might be kind of big too man and you could tell that they were both just like riding this really great high from these great auditions they just had. Uh-huh. Carl Weathers got the part of Apollo Creed in Rocky. Yeah. What did the other man get? Uh, Lando Calrissian. Luke Skywalker. Oh, interesting. In, I close, though. In... Yeah, I guess that would have been way too early for Star Lando. Star Wars, yeah. But, uh, you never know. But, yeah, how crazy is that? Sweet. Apollo Creed and Luke Skywalker bumping into each other after their auditions. That's pretty cool. Really cool. Um... I wanted to say something else about the uh, steady cam thing. Something else about steady cam. So four years after Rocky, a was small nineteen eighty small film, uh, The Shining comes out. Oh, right, The Shining, and uh, which took like forever to make. Yeah, um, but that has a really famous a really steady cam shot as well. Talking about the big wheel, the big wheel, the kid yeah. using the big wheel going through the, and then he sees the twins and stuff. Um, that's a really famous, really long steady cam shot. So, um, yeah, it is. It's 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 really long, and the sound design in that is really yeah. specific as well. Where it goes from hardwood to carpet and hardwood to carpet. Yeah, I would say it's unimaginably long. Like you, you never think a take moving at that speed could last that long, right? And um, turning that many corners. So James Crab, who did was the deep director of photography on Rocky is the one who's credited with doing the first Steadicam shot because, you know, um, it was this, the part where Rocky runs up the steps. Yeah. That's the, the first Steadicam. Um, awesome. Interestingly, at the same time that he was doing that stuff, yeah. uh, figuring that out, um, Stanley Kubrick was trying to figure out stuff for, for his film work, including The Shining. All right. Um, there were... The Steadicam was developed um, for, by the military, for use in essentially trenches. All right. To be able to shoot footage and understand warfare better. Yeah. There were three steady cams in the entire world. Whoa. Um, and this is the story as I understand it. All right. Okay, so this isn't gospel, but this is how I how I was told. Um, <clears throat> Stanley Kubrick uh, was approached by Warner Brothers to make The Shining and he didn't want to do it because you know, Kubrick was like really into like sort of his own his own stuff like you know like the Barry Lyndons and, yeah. and stuff and so what often happens with these directors is they do one or two big commercial movies for big studios and then they go off and do their own thing because they sort of one earned the goodwill from the studios and two made some money so they can kind of fund their own things a lot of the time right so uh, he made a deal with Warner Brothers and said, I'll tell you what, I'll do The Shining, but you have to buy me my own Steadicam. There were wow. three in the world. Um, thinking that they would never do it. Right. They called his bluff and got him a Steadicam. Whoa. Which is how we ended up with uh, that stuff in The Shining. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Pretty, pretty cool. You've always been here, Mr. Torrance. 
I don't um, know if that's the real line. It's probably paraphrased. So, so talking about the camera stuff, yeah. um, there's a couple of really cool shots. So, um, you know, Spielberg had done Duel before this one, and um, there's, I mentioned there's a shot in the uncropped version. We Ooh. watched a cropped version yes. of it. Uh, in the uncropped version, there is a shot where you can see Spielberg in the back of the car with the camera. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. You had mentioned that. And they, wow. they avoided stuff like that with this film because uh, this is the first film to feature a Panaflex camera, which was a much more condensed, smaller camera, which allowed them more freedom. All right. Um, so, the, so not only is the movie the first mo- Panaflex film, it's also the first movie to ever feature a tracking shot in a car, in, inside a car, from front seat to back seat. Cool. And it's also the first ever, I'm pointing this out to you during the movie, Yeah. the first ever 360 degree shot inside a car. That was pretty awesome. And it's a great shot. It's it's it, it's a really great example of Spielberg's understanding about composition. Yeah. You you really so um next is Jaws for us. I've never seen Jaws. I believe. Yes. <laughs> You've seen Jaws. <laughs> I know um, I have. And Jaws even more so than this movie, I think, really demonstrates how Spielberg Spielberg uses uh, people and objects and yeah. moves them around without having to like do a ton of fancy stuff with the camera. Right, like the um, crossing, the crossing on and the well, beach. So like uh, in uh, Sugarland Express, he does. Yeah. His, there's a really really great shot that I liked where um, not too the same scene as the uh, or shortly after the scene where um, the the 360 degree shot happens. All right, um, they run out of gas. Yes, and they get the um, the captain to get his car and push their car. Yeah, and so they're in really close proximity to each other, the captain and the the two criminals. Um, and there's a shot looking through the captain's car. Yes, at Goldie Hawn and William Atherton looking back at him, and then in the top of the frame is the rearview mirror angled so you can see the captain's eyes yeah. and face, and so. Spielberg found this like really beautiful way to like capture three people looking like, essentially an over the shoulder shot, but right. three people kind of looking all at each other and and their reactions to each other and sort of a um, I don't want to say a mutual respect, but a mutual understanding that this isn't um, as dire a consequence as it as it needed to be. Yeah, they they touch on that theme a lot in the film, um, and these characters kind of get in over their heads. And Extremely. Everybody sort of realizes that except for uh, Lou Jean. Yeah. I think also in that moment it's showing that, you know, the captain he's probably got a little bit of a crush on Lou Jean. Yeah, she like, she like makes a little like, you know, a, a little sign to him through like on the glass. Yeah, and, she writes hi, but yeah. she doesn't blow on the glass so that the letters actually show up. She just smudges her fingertip yeah. and we never... But he smiles because he, you know... Yeah, I think he's... These are kids. Yeah, and he makes mention of how, you know, he's been on the force however long and he's never had to kill somebody and he's like, I don't intend to let today be that day. And yeah. So he's probably thinking like, I can't, I can't do something that's going to kill this pretty lass. Yeah. Played by Goldie Hawn. Kids over their heads. Yeah, well, um, scary. So later you, you see more, you know, other examples of this. Um, you have... Uh, you know where we needed that, Captain? Newfoundland, Canada. Right. Oh, going after what's her name? The um, there's a scene where they end up in a car dealership lot. Yeah, they chain, Big John's. They chain up the they chain up uh, officer officer slide slide patrolman. I wanted to say slider for some reason. I knew the ER wasn't right. I bet he had friends who called him slider. So, uh, well, that wasn't his real name in in the in real life. Wasn't yeah, slider. but you know. Um, After the movie, they were probably like, yeah, you're, you're that guy now. You're, you're him. So uh, they're in this dealership, and there's a, a movie theater, driving movie theater nearby, and they're playing Looney Tunes. Yeah. And uh, there's a Wile E. Coyote Roadrunner thing, and mm-hmm. so he makes all the noises for her to entertain her, and then he stops doing it because he has this realization. And we hear what the drive-in people hear, but what yeah. they can't. Um, it's all the sound effects and stuff, and sort of this um, idea uh, that like 
th- the 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 real world is like coming, but they can't they can't see it. Right. In this case, they can't hear it. Like they they don't have the the correct senses to like, hey, we're something's wrong here. Yeah, and they they kind of hint again like. William Atherton's character has this realization, I think, in this scene, and then the next day, uh, Lugene is out looking for a different car for them to take. Yeah, and he's in the in the motorhome in the camper with the uh, the cop, and um, they play a hypothetical, like hypothetically, if this happened, and they sort of start to play that out. This idea that you know maybe I should give up, right? You know, maybe maybe if I give up, maybe. Leniency can be seen to her. Right. He um, still ain't shot nobody. Right. Um, so anyways, I just... Uh, I thought that um, it was a really special way to kind of show those realizations dawning on him. Yeah. Especially with uh, the audio. Yeah. It was a cool moment. What I gleaned from that was that he was sort of seeing that, like, no matter how many different ways this chase continues... It just keeps ending in disaster, certainly yeah. for the coyote. And, uh, you know, the roadrunner gets to keep on running, but he's not exactly a roadrunner, if you know what I mean. Whoa, right. buddy. I almost right. dropped my mic pack. What did you think of uh, Goldie Hawn and, and William Atherton? Because this, these, like, maybe not so much for her, but for him, this is very different than what we normally see. Yeah, I mean, I've, I haven't seen every William Atherton performance. The two that stick out most major in my mind are pretty much him playing a jerk. In Ghostbusters, right. Musters, Ghostbusters, <laughs> and a jerk and a real genius, right? Um, so yeah, it was cool to see him play in a much more sympathetic guy who, you know, very unfortunately, but also due to his own choices, has roped himself into this insane situation. Has um, he used the word choices? Like, because that's the same same thing is used to um, uh, Goldie Hawn's character, yeah. Eugene. Where he says, you know, I just, you know, you're not a bad person. I can tell you just made some bad choices. Yeah. You know, and I thought that was, so that's interesting you used that. And they did. I mean, he, he had the choice at the beginning of the movie to just tell her, like, nope, go home. This was fun, but I just need to serve these right. last four months. And, and, cause in the long run, that's how they would have been able to keep their kid. Right. But, you know, he falls for it. She honey pots him. She, she gets him to break <laughs> out. And, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much doomed as soon as they walk out of that gate. As funny and as exciting as the movie is, you know, yeah. unfortunately, a big car chase like that usually only ends one way, especially in Los Angeles. <laughs> well, you know, uh, William Atherton is a stage, like he's trained on stage. Yeah. Whereas Goldie Hawn was, I mean, she was essentially a go-go girl, you know. Yeah, good um, old uh, Rowan Martin's laughing. Yeah, so... Uh, so she was, she's more TV. Yeah. So she would tend to get her, she would tend to be good early ah. in takes. And then the longer they went, she would sort of start to be not so great. Whereas he wouldn't be great in the early takes hmm. and would be better later on. Um, Spielberg eventually figured out that Goldie Hawn um, would get like a second wind All after right. they got like 13 in, 13 takes in or something. And so, I don't know if that's the exact number, but... I get you though, yeah. Uh, so what what he would do is he'd start all on her close-ups. Ah. Let her do her thing, and as she starts to wear down, he'd switch over to William Atherton's close-ups, and then come out for their two shots and things. Um, oh, that's for good thinking. Once she got her second wind and once he got going. Um... I don't know, kind of interesting. Again, like... I like how, that idea, that's for sure. With how young he was, I mean, just all of this, it really shows, like, what a, f- a phenom he was yeah. at such a young age. Big time. Um, and why there's no other director like him, and why we're doing this little Spielberg yeah. thingy thing. The Spielberg um, Odyssey? The Spielberg... The, the View the Right Thing. <laughs> the Spielberg... Spielberg... You can say Odyssey. Odyssey's Odyssey. good. Odyssey. Yeah. I feel like there's something with an S that means like a journey. Or saga. Um, saga. Well, oh, you know, I was thinking um, a second ago when I was talking about Goldie Hawn, you were talking about when I mentioned the the line where he says that, you know, you're not a you're not a bad person. Yeah. You just made some bad decisions. Um, that's actually another moment where um, audio doesn't get to them. 
Oh. Right? And it ha- it's, it's almost like those scenes are almost back to back. Um, they have the her father get on the radio. Right. And you can kind of see like a piece of her upbringing, maybe why she does the things she does. Yeah. Um, and uh, he, he, her father says something like, uh, if this man gave me a gun, I'd fly out there and shoot you myself. Yeah. It's like, wow, that's... Does he say he'd shoot her or he'd shoot Clovis himself? I think, I think he said her. Oh, okay. Um, he says she's, she's a, uh, essentially a disgrace and that she's always been one. He's always known she was one. Yeah. Um, it's pretty messed up, dude. And I like that, um, again, I think Slide, Officer Slide is similar to the, the captain, right? Yeah. That he, he has some affection for these people. He understands that they're not... And I think that's his that's his aha moment, right? Is yeah. like, hey, uh, here here's this person who's her father on the radio for everyone to hear. Like, yeah. you're you're a terrible daughter and all this stuff. Being a complete jerk. But yeah, complete. so just another example of audio that doesn't get to her. Some kind of toothless pink raisin man. <laughs> pink Being a raisin jerk. man. He had some teeth, I guess. Yeah. Man, it was a fun movie. I uh, uh, I pointed out about how we love, you know, Spielberg loves to have a kid open a door, and you made yeah. a pretty good, good comment about that. Um, oh yeah, which kids, feel free kids, to. Oh uh, yeah, kids don't please. know. Kids don't know what's on the other side of the door. They don't know what's coming. Yeah. Right. Like they don't know that there's danger coming. You know? Yeah. I think I, when you when you say like kids open the door, I think to like Close Encounters and yeah. Right. Um, I'm sure there are even more examples within Steven Spielberg's oh, yeah, movies, yeah, yeah. but those are definitely the big two. And then there's a lot of funny stuff going on. Like every time they drive through a new town, like more and more locals are coming out to meet them on the street. And a lot of them are kids who are just so excited to have something to do. Yeah. There's the funny scene where in the very last town, there's a bunch of kids just sitting on the back section of the roof. Yeah. As I like the pig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some poor kid gives his pet pig the Goldie Hawn. He's peeing on me. Yeah, yeah, the pig actually was peeing on her. I believe it. Yeah. I do believe that. That uh, I've never held a pig. I've never been peed on by a pig. Yeah. But if I were to be, I might scream just as much as she was screaming. She was at least having fun with it, though. I salute her for the fun she had while not breaking character as a poor little piglet took a whiz on her jeans I'm assuming on her jeans they don't show the pee pig the pig pee thankfully yeah and, and that's okay the uh the um Whoa. the shootout at the uh, car dealership was pretty pretty epic oh that well. scene drove me crazy not, well, not that it was a bad scene, just that those two characters were so stupid. Yeah. And so heavily armed. But it, it, you know what? We're seeing, we're seeing char- characters, people like that today doing Ain't that the s- truth. stupid stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, these guys were literally the argument against the good guy with the gun, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, mythos or well, well, they were like fallacy, you could say. Redneck, um, like lynch mob guys, essentially. Yeah. Um, they thought they could take justice in their own hands and they would be heroes for it. Right. You know. Drove there in a Volvo, oddly enough. <laughs> With a kid that ended up running away. Yeah. Yeah. A, a guy and his kid pull up in a pickup truck and join a third man. And they get into his Volvo to go hunt down these uh, these fugitives. So he had Interesting the, choice. Spielberg had the, uh, he had the art department make a six foot like diorama. Of, right. the, of the car lot so they could plan out that sequence. Oh, wow. So they could figure out exactly how to, how to make it happen and make it make sense. It's a hell of a sequence, that's for sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's white knuckle, man. Like, I was watching it because those guys are just so stupid and they're just shooting off in every direction. And, you know, you had to wonder, like, what if these guys had shown up at 9 a.m. instead of, you know, just after dawn when there were more people around and right. stuff? Right, right. Idiots. Just so, so stupid. Well, and, and you see that with the the cops too, right? Like, there's there's sort of like I don't want to say vigilante cops, but there are, you know, they're they're driving through these towns, and the towns all have cops or right. the, you know state patrol or whatever from other parts of the state. Yes, yeah, so like they like, want to get in on the action, get in on it. which is which is why we get that cool you know car crash. Yeah, pile up with all the flares that you pointed out. Oh, I love that part. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, and that whole pile up was caused by one dumb cop. 
uh, trying to intercept them and, well, and to, just fouling up so badly. And two patrol guys in new cars that drove three hours just so they could get in on the fun. Did they show up at that same pileup? Yeah, remember they... they yeah, that's right. One um, crashes like just straight into a car and the other one like ends up flipping over on its side. Yeah, and oh boy, completely ruining those beautiful, beautiful cars. Although those guys were from Louisiana. They had no business being there. No, they just wanted to get in on it. They sure did, and it backfired. So the so Spielberg shot that whole thing, um, <clears throat> shot all the cars moving in on each other without yeah. anybody hitting it, hitting anyone. Oh, that's cool. And then, um, and then, they did all the you know, they got four cameras going, and they did all the side swiping and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much like the most economical way they could do it because they didn't want to have to try and buy new cars, right, to redo the whole thing again. So. They wrecked so many cars in this movie. Two of my favorite gags were <clears throat> when our heroes have to stop for gas. And so yeah. the whole cop caravan is like 100 yards behind them just waiting and waiting. And then when they pull away, some of the cop caravan follows them. And then a bunch of cars pull into the gas station to, to, yeah. to fill up and check their oil. <laughs> that was hilarious. And then another one is when a guy has like a welding mask on. And he's like welding something on the front of a car around the headlight. And yeah, he's trying to fix the, like, the grill, I think. Yeah, and yeah. he's welding something, and a cop jumps in and backs it up. But yeah, apparently his back door had been hanging open, and he just jams it against yeah. the wall and bends it the wrong way. That made me laugh quite a bit. You know, we were we were wondering during the... I just came across this thing. Um, during the drive-in scene, yeah. there's a movie playing. Yeah, were you able to find out what it is? It's called... That's what they were watching? Yeah, it's they were a watching snake movie. A snake movie. Yeah. That's a good one. Oh, trailers for Downsizing with Matt Damon. Have you seen Downsizing? I have. I haven't seen it. I may have seen the trailer. Okay. Skyler, again, before Lady Bird, trailer for Downsizing plays, and he leans over to me and he goes, are we to believe that they just live in a world without snakes? Well, and I mean... I was like, that's a very good point. He hasn't, has he not seen the movie? He hasn't seen the movie. Well, then maybe there's a snake in the movie. Yeah, I hope know. there is now that I'm thinking about it. Well, or, or anything. Spiders. Snakes. Spiders would still be pretty bad I even mean, if you're downsized. Yeah. But anyways, that's not, that's not this movie. That's not what we're here to do. Um, oh, I should yawn straight into my microphone. That's what I should do. Good job, Steve. We're talking Sugarland Express. Pep it up. Car chases, man. <laughs> Goldie Hawn. Goldie Hawn. Um, you know the uh, the Prison Break actually the 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 pre release center. Yeah, that was a, the actual place. Oh wow, really? Shot it. Yeah, it's funny because cool. I was watching. I was like, do they really have places this open where it'd be so easy to just walk? Oh, turns out, yeah, that place was very low, low, ultra low security. Yeah, I would say what's lower than ultra low. That's how low the security Open. was there. Yeah. Open. Just honor system security. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's one other thing One other thing about the movie. I mean, you may have some other things you want to talk about, but one really specific thing that I love about this movie. Yeah. And you don't know it until the very end of the film and you see the, la- the few credits that they have oh, all pop right. up. Who did the music? Bum, ba da ba 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 da ba 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 John Williams. John Williams, yes. This is the first time John Williams and Steven Spielberg worked together. Wow, really? Yeah, I mean, this is his first theatrical film. I guess that's true. Except for The Twilight Zone, I think John Williams has done every single Spielberg movie. Whoa. Yeah, so that's a lot of movies. That's incredible. Yeah. Spielberg wanted a uh, an orchestra, yeah, for it. But as you as you know, they did not use one because no. it's sort of the, sort of southern. It's very much simple. Uh, yeah, there's a really uh, really weird drum beat going on quite a few times that I did not expect to hear in a movie like this. Yeah, it's very hip hoppy, very surprising. Well, it's like almost like. Um, and then of course there's the Twelve Days of Christmas. Maybe the. Yeah. The t- drumbeat thing sort of made me feel like time was running out. That's kind of what that kind of left me with. Ah. Um, See, the and, one I'm talking about happened at the very beginning. Oh. And it was just a really weird kind of hip-hoppy drumbeat going on. And I was like, oh, that's 
kind of ahead of its time. If, if oh, maybe. If I'm not mistaken. It was cool, though. It was a nice, nice touch wherever it came and from. And it's so different from everything else John Williams Ain't that did for truth? him. I mean, for the most part. I mean, uh, Catch Me If You Can is very different. It's very jazzy. Yeah. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about that when we get to it. But it's like very like beat dink jazzy, not quite. Yeah, it's very like, quite like 60s jazz. jazz club jazz. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is uh, kind of where... John Williams has his roots in jazz. Oh, all right. You can hear it every once in a while in some, like uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. Prisoner of Jazkaban. Yeah, that one has uh, some cool jazzy stuff in it. Nice. I haven't the, watched that one in a while. The Night Bus. Listen to the track, The Night Bus. All right. I'm, I remember The Night Bus. It had that creepy talking, shrunken, shrunken head. Yeah, yeah. And Ernie, the driver. Hey, we're running late. Uh, he probably doesn't even say I, that. I don't, I don't know. know. Um, okay, anything else you want to talk about with Sugarland Express? Gosh, I don't know. Um, it's an exciting movie. It's a pretty funny movie. It is um, pretty funny. Goldie Hawn's great in it. You know, kind of has an ending that is just kind of the way it was going to work out. Yeah, it, um, it's uh, if you're sort listening, of... you should have seen it by now. Viewed as one of the few Spielberg movies that ends on a down note. I guess that's kind of true. Huh? Usually, he 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 he's a big um, as I, as am I, a big fan of sort of like what people termed the Hollywood ending. Yeah, uh, which I think is dumb, a dumb term. But um, sorry if you love that term, but I think it's dumb. Um, Isn't there a movie called Hollywood Ending? Yeah, probably. I shall look because I think it's all, the ending to all movies. They're all Hollywood endings. Hollywood ending 2002. Cool. Starring? Oh, it's Woody Allen. Um, I don't need to talk about him. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, that was uh, the Sugarland Express. The next episode that Steve and I do, we'll be watching Jaws. Whoa. And I don't get to pick our next movie right now. I get to pick you and Joey's next movie. Well, I, I really, I'm really picking that. Because it's a it's a pretty specific. Uh, we don't have a bucket. Well, we should at least announce it right now. Yeah, right? we'll announce it. Do you want? To, you don't know what it is, do you? No. Should I pretend I'm reaching into a bucket? <laughs> yeah, just make some noises with your mouth. <laughs> Paper. <laughs> Paper noises. Cool. And oh, I can't read that. What's oh, here, it say? I'll take it. Uh, it's uh. My favorite James Bond film. What? Which, you have a favorite? Yep. Which, uh, and I, I do own all of the James Bond, the actual James Bond films, not the goofy Casino Royale. That's not really a real James Bond film. Oh, okay. I thought you meant like not Her Majesty's Secret Service. No, I also don't, I, I also don't own the, there's a Casino Royale that was made for TV. Really? Um, and I don't think that exists on DVD. I'm not sure. When did that happen? Before all the other James Bond stuff. Wow. It's the very first, the very first James Bond. Um, James Bond. Goldfinger. 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 Cool. Greatest Bond girl. Which one was that? Best Bond. I'm not going to say. Listeners will have to tune in. Feels like forever from now, though. To tune in and and hear it themselves. Goldfinger. Or watch the movie. Best uh, Bond uh, henchman is in the movie. Whoa. Yeah, it's a good one. It's really good. It, it, uh, the Austin is... Powers, that first Austin Powers movie's got a, movie got a lot of references from Goldfinger. Really? Yeah. We'll in talk about way. it after. In a way, so did the third. Sure. Um, so you guys are watching Goldfinger. We're going to watch Jaws. And something else. And something else that you and Joey are going to pick. Something mysterious. I'm excited because I haven't watched Jaws in like months. <laughs> maybe since around the Fourth of July. Yeah, I haven't watched it probably in a couple of years. Maybe really, a year or two. Yeah, I mean, you know me. I I, I don't. Uh, there's one exception dun, dun, dun. to movies I watch over and over again. It's probably E.T. I've seen E.T. this year. Dun, dun. Um, but uh, generally, I, I want to consume things I've never seen before. Yeah. Before I go back and spend a lot of time rewatching ah! things. Unless I, unless I feel a real need to like... Like for The Last Jedi. Learn. No, not for The Last Jedi. I'm telling you, it's better the second time. All right. We can, we can have a short discussion about Last Jedi if you want real quick. Since at the end of the episode, 
And in case, we'll try and do as spoiler free as possible. But, yes. Um, spoiler in, alert. But there is a spoiler alert right now if, uh, if you don't want to hear anything about Last Jedi. Right. We're going to try not to spoil it, but we just might. So We're going to keep it short, though. Proceed with caution. I went to see it. Yeah. I kept a critical mind, and I enjoyed it, but I was like, this has some problems. I waited a week. I went to see it again. I kept my critical mind turned on, uh-huh. and the movie was even better the second time. Okay. I, I, I enjoyed the movie while I watched it. Yeah. The more I thought about it afterwards, the less I liked the film. Um, as vaguely as possible, what didn't you like? I thought it was too long. It's pretty long. I think the stories are all over the place. Disagree. I, I, I fine. You can disagree. Um, <laughs> there's one of those storylines. Uh, I understand why it's there, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it took time away from being able to like focus on things that would have been really interesting. Hmm. Um, I can I can talk about what a couple of storylines are without yeah. spoiling. We already warned you. Spoilers. Um, we already warned you guys. The Rose and Finn storyline. Yeah. That was so much screen time devoted to what amounts to very little when we could have been learning about Kylo Ren and Rey and Snoke. We need, we still know nothing about Snoke. Um, we know he likes gold and red. Yeah. Um, that that would have been a better use of the time. Yeah. The last like 30 minutes of the movie don't need to be there. Whoa! Um, don't need to be there. One, okay, so here's a really big spoiler alert. Yeah. Really big spoiler, everyone. If you haven't seen it or don't want to know, you've been warned. Um, once the jump to light light speed warp speed happens, yeah, everything after that is inconsequential, with the exception of one thing that could have been done anywhere else. Wow. Um, the characters, with the exception of Luke Skywalker, yeah, are in the exact same position and place they are in. Thirty minutes from that from that moment, they're in the exact same position and place. As they are at the end of the film, nothing, nothing, no character development happens. Nothing important to the plot happens except for Luke Skywalker stuff, um, and even that is bare bones. Huh. Interesting. I, I just felt, I just felt like you know, like they could have just kind of cut to the chase a little bit. Yeah. And I think, I think the things that especially didn't work for me were things that were kind of holdovers from like the prequels. Like, yeah. like there was some. You know, stuff with the little kids and whatnot. Like, it just didn't, doesn't Disney work. Disney owns it now. It's going to be there. That has, no, that has nothing to do with Disney. That has to do with Ryan Johnson bringing things, trying to, like... Why is it that this is the only film that, except for the prequels, that anybody ever says the words Darth Sidious? And it's also... Did they say Darth Sidious in yeah, this movie? Yeah, Luke, Luke refers to Darth Sidious. I don't even remember hearing that. Yeah, when he's talking to Ray, he refers to Darth Sidious. So, it's like... He was insistent on trying to like make up for the prequels by having some bridge to them, but it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Huh. And I'm glad he's not coming back to direct the last one. And I'm worried about the, the, the new trilogy that he's going to do. Which new trilogy is he doing? Ryan Johnson signed a deal with Disney to do a whole trilogy of Star Wars films outside like, of this. Like a Star Wars stories? Yeah, but it's, they're all connected to each other. Wow. So I don't know, man. I I'm, like this movie a lot. I I'm glad J.J. Like... Abrams is coming back. I'm glad J.J. Abrams is coming back too, but I also like Ryan Johnson's The Last Jedi. I'll tell you why. You can like it all you want. They let us know multiple times that we've got to kill the old and let that which is new flourish. But they don't. They totally do. No, they don't. I'll, I'll, let's address this, this point first. Go ahead. The entire film is them reinforcing the idea that history has to repeat itself. They spend the... No, the, not maybe. They spend the entire movie... That's why they bring bring back a beloved character from the past that I won't sure. say. That's why um, you see a sunken X-wing at one point <laughs> in the film. It's it's why you have the tree and the hole in the film. Yeah. Um, it's why you have the startling, startlingly similar Imperial guards in the film. Yeah. I mean, the the whole movie is a reinforcement of history repeating itself, in including including Ray at the end of the film. Yeah, but also, they've now done these two movies, Force Awakens and Last Jedi. They've 
completely beaten the death to death the idea of history repeating itself and homages to the original trilogy and all that. No. Which means episode nine. That's what people said after after Force Awakens. That that they got yeah, that's they got true. this bridge the bridge to these films out of the way and kind of like went back home to, to so they could start things anew. Yeah. And that's what J.J. Abrams said that whole movie was about was you have to go home in order to start something new. And then Ryan Johnson came in and kind of did away with the like there's there's stories about how he did away with other previous scripts really? and how, and how um, Mark Hamill went to him and said, here's the deal. This is not what I would write for this character. This is not how Luke would talk. Huh. I've had my say. I'm going to put my trust in you as a director. All right. But at the beginning of filming, that's what he said. And it shows like it really shows. I was just fine with Luke Skywalker. In this it's movie. okay for you to like it. I, I disagree. I, I don't think it's a very well-made movie. It's Luke Skywalker. 40 years later, he's going to be a different guy. No, I don't have a problem with him being a different guy. Um, I think it's, um, you know, there's a lot of people that feel like it's like, you know, the, the ultra Star Wars fans, I'm not one of them. Yeah. But like, the people are like, oh, it's a betrayal to... Oh, people are so up their we, own asses about it. I, I, I don't totally agree with it, but I, I understand where that's coming from in that, like, it's kind of like understanding the source material. Like, we talk about comic book movies all the time, right? Yeah. And, like, understanding who Batman is and, like, is it okay for Batman to do certain things? And I get what they're saying. It's like, you have to understand the source material. And if if the people who have been living the longest with the characters say yeah. you're not getting the source material correct, and then the movie comes out and the fans go, holy shit, you didn't get the source material correct, that should be a red flag. Hmm. However... I had fun while I was watching it. Nice. I will add it to my Star Wars collection. Booyah. Uh, I will not reject watching the film. Um, Better the second time. Know, I'll watch it again. I'm not, I'm not going to run out to the theater and see it again, but um, I love the Porgs. See, I don't love the Porgs. Yeah. I think they're absolutely adorable, but I mean, talk about a, a, an element of the film that does nothing. Except it's the porgs. Except but they're adorable. Except that cute. the porgs, the porgs don't eat screen time away. You That's know what I mean? true. Every time you see the porgs, and while they're like cute and funny and stuff, they're always involved, kind of almost like as background characters, or they happen to be there when something else important is going on. Yeah. They never. We never spend time following porgs for half an hour when we could be following an important storyline. That part's true, but in terms of. Following Ray and Finn for half an hour. You mean Rose and Finn? What did I say? Ray and Finn. Ray and Finn. The the. Which, when by I the saw way, it, they which, put Ray in her place. Which, which by the way, the Rose and Finn storyline is all about trying to bring back, reinforce the idea of history repeating itself, which Re- is bringing back a Han Solo type character to betray the to get his gold. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter if it change, spoiler alert. It doesn't matter if it if they tweak it slightly because yeah. you know that dude's coming back. Um, yeah, of course. And probably to redeem himself. It's just like, even Kylo Ren's like, TIE Fighter. I mean, it's just like, it all just is like, hey, you remember this? Hey, you remember this? Hey, you remember hey, this? Kylo Ren's TIE Fighter. It's like so similar to Darth Vader's like TIE Interceptor or whatever they call well, it. Well, yeah, of course, because he worships Darth Vader. I know, Vader. I'm just saying. he's going to have his car. I'm just saying that like, Everything in this film is all about reinforcing the idea that history repeats itself. It's not about. It's not about. No, I disagree. Okay. Well, we'll see when the next movie comes out. Rose and Finn, they go to find a guy. Everything leading up to that makes you think they're about to find Lando Calrissian. I and then don't agree just, with that at all. Then they not just smash. It. I I hundred percent disagree with that. They smash your expectations. He's not Lando Calrissian. He's Han Solo. Maybe, but the stuff that they pepper in makes you think. They're going to meet Lando, aren't they? No, not at all. Yeah, everybody else I've talked not, to was like, I totally thought they not, were going to be meeting Lando. Not Calrissian once did I even cross my mind. But that's you. Everybody else hey, I've Des? talked to hey, Des? says, and they all thought it was going to be Lando Calrissian. Did you think Calrissian. they were going to go see Lando Calrissian on the uh, casino planet? No. Okay, no. Okay, so you are the two out of the 50,000 people I've spoken to in person in their own you homes. You not spoken to 50,000 people. On the very night that I watched the movie, I went to 50,000 homes. Yeah, no. And they all said, I totally thought that was going to be Lando. It might have been four or five. No, people. because there's nothing that ever told us that Lando would know how to be a code breaker or a hacker. You're right about that. So, like, why would that ever have crossed my mind? But everything else about... That would, that would, have, been, that would have been an even bigger betrayal to what we know Star Wars to be. Maybe. 
But most people were like, I totally thought. When she said high stakes gambler, I was like nuts to the code thing. Mm-hmm. High stakes gambler, they get to the planet. There's architecture that harkens back to Cloud City. I might have actually enjoyed that more. I would have too. Apparently, unfortunately, Billy D. Williams is in pretty poor health. So they're saying that that's why they didn't. I, 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 but what they did, and like the X-Wing being sunken underwater. Do you, and you're you like, think, oh, they're going to lift that up so Luke think, can fly his X-Wing. No, but she just does the rock the thing at the end. which is Right, but she like, doesn't leave the X-Wing. She doesn't lift the X-Wing. That's, what, that's what Luke it. does, is the rock. He does the rock on, on, on Dagobah. But then Yoda lifts the X-Wing so Luke can fly it away. It doesn't matter if they don't do every single thing that he did. It's still, they, they still do repeat themselves over right, and over again. but then they re- crush your expectations they of what absolutely you think is going to happen. I'll tell you how they crush my expectations is me thinking that this was going to advance the Star Wars story in any meaningful way. It totally did. No. Okay, you tell me in in like one or two sentences Yeah. what is the point of the Rose and Finn storyline? One or two sentences. Well, tragically, it's to show that a lot of fans aren't going to get what they want. No. Which no. is... Don't don't do that. Which I'm talking a, about the story thematic which is a elements. Finn, Poe, makeout set. Yeah, I know, right? Just focus on the on the story. Finn got to kill Phasma. That the, he doesn't have to he doesn't have to go on that adventure to do that. But he got to kill her. Uh, okay. And they don't care about why he had to do it or not. They knew you Finn's got to kill Phasma in this movie. So you think the point of that storyline is? For him to kill Phasma. No, the point of that storyline is you think they're going to come up with a way to do it, but it's war, and in war, some missions fail. I think you're totally and wrong. They had a failure of a mission. And this is this is this is why I'm. But I'm at so least glad he you got to kill Phasma. This is why I'm so glad you and I disagree. Spoiler alert, by the way. Um, this is why I think the whole reason that there's a Finn Rose storyline. Yeah. These are both people who are not expected to be heroes. All right. Going on a mission, and the whole the whole thing that um, they talk about with Luke Skywalker from the opening crawl, even yeah. is that he's supposed to be the spark of hope. Okay. The whole point of Rose and Finn is that they're the spark of hope to lead the new rebellion. All right. But I don't think they're going to lead necessarily. No, no, no. To to like, well, they are. I mean, I mean, they're, they're leaders. They're, now. Everybody's dead. I mean, who's who else is going to lead? There's a couple people around. Right, but they're going to be. They're going to be up there. They're going to be high I mean, on the list. I mean, Finn already is viewed by the rest of the Resistance, at, we, as we learn from Rose, yeah. that he's the, one of the heroes of the Resistance. Sure. So they're going to be leaders of the Resistance. They put, they put their lives on the line for it. So I, I believe that their entire thing is all about being the spark of hope for these like children or whatever to like rise up. Yeah. Um, going to have little rebel kids. They spent the way sticks. too much time on that. And for for that and no, no, no. and for the fact and for the fact that they it. spent all that time for that reason and that's not the reason that you told me that 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 storyline exists and that tells me the Poe Finn makeout session no no that tells me that people who are watching the movie um missed the point that they were trying to make I don't think they made it well I so don't think, think they made the point well you think those two are the spark yes rather than Luke. Luke Skywalker. That was whole that was Luke's whole point. Showing up, dodging about a million laser blasts after getting a really nice haircut and hair dye job. And then they, being like, all, they, all they did is make Check make, it out, dudes. All they did all he did was like tease Kylo Ren and make him look like a doofus. That's, he did. That's not like being the spark of hope. No, but it was effective. It was cool. I, I, I'll admit, it was cool. It was, a, it was a great scene. It was fun and, to watch. And now Kylo Ren gets to be haunted by Luke for the rest of his life. I don't, I don't think it'll be Kylo so much, but... I think Luke's going to split his time evenly between Rey and Ren. Um, I don't know. Watch it a second time, man. It's, it's no, so much better the second time. I'll watch it a second time and win some video. Man, you're robbing yourself. Of I got, a, I, man, really I got Oscar movie. movies to go see. Oh God, that's right. I got Sorry, important, Oscar important season. good movies to watch. Whoa! You just said Star Wars: The Last Jedi isn't important it's, good. I I already said it wasn't a good movie. Wow, dude! You've if, completely changed your tune since we started no, this part of the conversation. I had fun. I had fun watching the movie. It's 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 a popcorn film. I yeah. can I can have fun watching bad movies, but I can still acknowledge that they're bad movies. 
I yeah. think Ryan Johnson did not make a good Star Wars film. I don't know, man. And I love Ryan Johnson. I love Rick. I do too. I like the Brothers Bloom. I think Looper's okay. I don't uh, think it's great or anything. But... I love Brothers Bloom and Brick. I think Looper's pretty good. Yeah, Looper's What's the just... other one? I forget. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Shit balls. If we can't remember it, it's clearly not important. What the heck, Ryan Johnson? Um, Last Jedi, man. Two thumbs up from this, whatever I'm considered in this line of work. Uh, check it out. Buy all your kids all the toys. Get them all the lightsabers. Ray gets, Ray gets a new lightsaber. Porg. That's all I have to say. Porg. Porg. Crystal Critters. Eh. Sea cow thing. <laughs> a sea cow. All right. That's enough of us arguing. Um, All right. If we ruin Star Wars for you, it's your own fault. Yeah, you stayed to listen. All right, everyone. Until next time, Bon Cinema.